All right. So um, essentially what I have here, I wanted to talk real quick before I launch into the impulse. So today I'll talk about the impulse and, and then we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Fourier transform and introduce that concept. I'm not gonna go, f and I am not, and the book does not go and give a really thorough treatment to the Fourier transform. It gives an introductory um, idea of the Fourier transform, which, which is really what you guys need to be able to understand what it is, okay? So we'll get to that here today. Before I launch into this though, I wanted to talk a little bit about the types of problems that you have on, on homework seven right now at the moment, right? So basically um, you have problems like this where you've got some sort of a periodic function, okay? And what I've asked you to do is to basically do a couple of things, F figure out the Fourier series coefficients and then graph the waveform, all right? Um, so in the case of, of a waveform like this, what I'm basically saying is, well, oops, figure out for me this guy, not negative, but e to the j n omega naught t, right? Where I can have infinitely many of these alpha n values, right? And then I can convert that to the other forms of the series. And then we said there's an integral to figure out the alpha n values, which is this guy. All right. And I can always relate these in different ways, okay, to the different forms of the series, right? To the cosine, sine, or the shifted cosine. There's all sorts of ways to be able to relate those things. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so for me to be able to handle this problem, I basically have to go through in four steps like this. So what's the period? What's the function? All right. When I did my example so far, I did square waves. Square waves are pretty easy. Okay. Something like this is a, <clears throat> a little bit more challenging. And the ones that you have on the homework, really, they're not hard, but you have to, you potentially have multiple functions that you need to be able to deal with, right? So what's the period? What's the function? Evaluate the alpha n integral for n not equal to zero, right? For n equal to zero, we typically have problems. So for n equal to zero, what, first of all, what frequency am I talking about when I say n equal to zero? DC, all right, zero frequency. So this guy finding the average value, the fourth step is how I would do that. Then at this point, you know, if you look at the code that I've, we talked through last week, all the code you would need to be able to sort of graph this stuff, I, I've given you kind of templates for that. All right, so you sh as long as you can get through the calculus, all right, you should be able to, to, to get through this, okay? Um, and there should be at this point, pretty generous uh, rounding. I made an announcement over the weekend. There was somebody out there having, having troubles. One of the problems you run into is like, I, I, I tried to say, if you were looking at, at, um, at uh, Discord, if you get an alpha N value that is zero, Right, you can look at that. You can do some calculations and figure out that certain alpha values are zero. Well, the computer is probably going to say when it does its calculations that it comes up with numbers like 10 to the minus 17. Okay, well, if in your computer you come up with 10 to the minus 15, it thinks that's two orders of magnitude off. That's pretty significant error, even though they're both zero. Right, so so sometimes I have to adjust those um, those sorts of things. All right, if you come across an issue in, in problem one, two, three, and four, the whole entire homework, if you plot the, the, the graphs and the graphs look correct, in other words, they look like the function, you're probably right, all right? In which case there's, there's an issue with the rounding. At this point, I don't think that should be a problem because I've made it pretty generous at this point. Um, and I think people have gotten through at least through problem three. Um, so I don't think there should be any issues with it, but I do want to make a, make a point about that. All right. <clears throat> so when I'm looking at, at this particular thing, if I want to just talk through real quick, what's the process here? So I say, what's the period? What is the period of this waveform that I've drawn here? What would be T here? It looks like it's 50. Yep. T is 50. All right. 50 seconds. All right. So this guy repeats every 50. Right? I can see that because he starts at zero, goes up, and then comes back down to zero. The way I see that is x of t equals x of t plus capital T. Right? So if I skip ahead 50, I've got the same value. Okay, that's how I see that. All right, now, um, 
evaluating the function. What is the function? So my goal was basically gonna to be to compute this integral, but I need to know what X of T is over that period. So what would I have to do in this case? When I say, what is the function? What do I have to do? Well, I gotta integrate over a period, right? So if I gotta integrate over a period, then what do I have to do? I gotta figure out what the function is over that period. So what is it in this case? What is X of T? Is it just 50 X? Um, it's just T in this case, right? I'm mean, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I see that it's linear, right? It goes up 50 in a time of 50, right? Mm -hmm. So that tells me that it's just T, all right? So that means when I set up my integral, I'd be doing my integral one over 50, zero to 50, T E to the negative J N omega naught T dt okay and why, why are you multiplying one over the period uh to the integral again because that's the definition of it uh just because it's the definition gotcha yeah. right <clears throat> so um and we talked intuitively why that was the definition last week right um but but it's th that one over t ends up in there so once i do that that's an integration by parts all right and what happens a lot of times, because you're multiplying a function times e to the negative j n omega naught t, you're going to end up with, with um, integration by parts, typically. Okay. Now, for the problem that you have in the homework, I think what you have is something like this, where it goes up, flattens off, goes down. All right. So how many functions do I have to do in that case? Three. Don't you have to do three? Yep, you have to do three different functions that apply over three different parts of the period. Now, technically, I guess you have four, right? Because this guy repeats. So there's actually one, two, three, four, right? But the fourth one is, is always zero, okay? So um, there's not much, there's, there's not a whole lot to this. The thing to remember when I, when I get this and I go through and I do this answer, I, whatever I get is gonna be a function of N, right? In other words, I have to plug N in there to figure out what the value of alpha is, right? It's gonna be a function of N. In other words, it's different for each harmonic number, okay? Uh, so I'm getting, there better be an N still in my answer is basically what it, what it comes down to. Now, you don't have to do a whole lot of simplification to be able to do what I'm asking you to do to basically jump, drop it into MATLAB and plot it. You don't, basically I could take that result. You don't need to simplify it a whole lot. All right, you should just be able to take it and, and use it, okay? If you can get the alpha N values, getting an A, the B, the C, the theta should be pretty straightforward. All right, I've pretty much given you the code to be able to do it, okay? All right, the key thing is gonna be this. Thing to remember, this alpha n calculation here really doesn't typically work at n equal to zero. And the reason for that is typically what's going on is I'm bringing down an n. And I, so in other words, I have a one over n. When n equals zero, one over zero is undefined, right? So to, to handle that, we basically say, find the average value, right? The average value, what's the expression for, for the average value? So a of zero is, or alpha zero is the average value. What's the expression for that? One over t times what? Which integral? Well, so, so what would change about that integral here? So what's, let me ask it this way. Rather than thinking about the integral, what is the definition of an average, right? It's the sum divided by the, the time in this case, right? So how do I get the sum? Okay, which would be the integral, right? X of T dt, which if I compare, if I plugged in N equal to zero, that's exactly what I would get, okay? All right, <clears throat> so technically they're the same equation, but you can kind of see that if I keep it as a function of N, I might get something goofy that results. All right, so I, I have to plug in n equal to zero before I do the integral. All right, I don't wanna say much more about that because I'm sure I'm, I'll confuse you more than I need to confuse you, all right? So, so those are the four steps. Follow that process and you more or less have the code to be able to, 
to approach these problems. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on uh, and talk about this idea of the impulse function. Okay. Um, the impulse function is a function you guys might have seen that in differential equations, maybe Dirac delta. Is that term okay? Um, everybody's looking at me like I'm speaking French or something. I guess technically Dirac is French, but um, so how do I model? So basically, in in the the impulse function basically is a function that we use to to model things that happen very rapidly, right? A really rapid change in force, for instance. So example is, you know, if you're hitting a baseball, right? Essentially, what's happening is the baseball is coming in with you know, a particular velocity as it comes in, as soon as a player makes contact with the, the, the ball and the bat make contact, right? there's a rapid change in acceleration and he moves the other direction. Okay? If you think about the force that's applied to that, right? there's a force that the bat's gonna apply to the ball. If I had to think about what that force looks like as a function of time, all right, what, would it, what do you think it would look like? It'd be, it'd be really high, and how long would it be? Very tiny, all right? I'd have a very large force applied, and it wouldn't last very long, okay? So, so basically what I can say is that it would, it would have a pretty high height, and I'm just going to say it has a width epsilon, okay? So, so really tiny width, but it but has a lot of actual value. Now, that turns out that happens a lot in nature, right? That I have that kind of a thing occur. Like for instance, right? Let's say, let's say I had a circuit and I close a switch at time t equal to zero, okay? If I looked at the voltage right here, let's say this was just five volts, okay? If I close this switch at t equal to zero, and I said, what's V of T look like right here? What does V of T look like right there? What was our, what was our model for that? What does that look like? So V of T after the switch. V of T is the voltage in the middle of that circuit, not across the capacitor, just, just to be clear. So it's the, it's the, Basically, the voltage from here to here. No, uh -oh, it's not across a single component, so that throws everybody off. Okay. So let's let's do K, let's do KVL around the loop. What loop should I do KVL around? What loop should I do KVL around? It won't be constant. What loop though? So I'll do a loop that includes the five volt source, the switch and my V of T. That's a loop, right? I started here. I'm, sorry, I'm gonna do this slowly because it's important. I just did a loop that went like that. I can go through V of T like that. I'm basically saying V of T is the voltage across the R and the C, okay? All right, so in other words, I can redraw that circuit and I can say, I have five volts. I have a switch and I have this. Like that. Okay. Now, on the other side of that switch, I got an R and a C. And that R and the C have some impedance and all sorts of stuff like that, right? So if 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 there's no current flowing this way, how much voltage can there be across the R? none and that means ultimately there's there's no voltage across the capacitor either so at time before that switch closes right where's all the where's all the voltage that uh, that five volt source there's five volts here so five volts has to appear across something else if i have a five volt source across the switch so there'd be five volts right here right and how much voltage appears across here zero Okay, so there'll be zero across there. Now, once that switch closes, that all changes, right? Once that switch closes like that, there's no longer five volts there or zero volts there. There's gotta be five, right? 
So that means the voltage here is suddenly going to drop up or jump up, right? And we called this five U of T, right? So five U of T is the voltage V of T. Now I did that slowly because I people, the whole idea of, of what voltages do in circuits like that always kind of confuses people. If you don't really understand KVL, then that gets a little bit confusing. All right, that's, that's actually open circuits have voltages across them, right? So I, I said, it's important to, to probably get that, right? But the reason I was doing this was not, not to, to get too lost in that conversation. The thing I wanted to say to you is, well, V of T looks like that five U of T. So what is U of T? What do we call that thing U of T? Unit step, okay? What, what would the derivative of that look like? Do what? Zero, all right? It's kind of zero, not quite zero. Anybody online have an idea? What's the derivative of that? It's, yeah, it's zero because the derivative of zero is zero. The derivative of a oh. constant is zero. Would it, would it be one? Well, in calculus, they, sh they told you if I have a discontinuity, what happens at a discontinuity? Can't have a derivative, all right? In engineering problems, that becomes a problem. Why does that become a problem? Because I know that this thing didn't rise infinitely fast, right? In other words, that happened because I closed a switch. And I, I can't close the switch infinitesimally fast, right? There's a certain amount of time that it takes. So if I zoomed in on this, on this period right here, what would I actually see? Some kind of ramping, which means if I looked at the derivative, what would it be? It would be really short and really big. In other words, really short time-wise, right? The derivative of this guy would be a constant. Boy, I'm out of space here. All right, the derivative of this guy would be a con it would be, well, be exactly like what I've shown down here. All right, it would be really big and really narrow. Okay, that's kind of what an impulse really is representing. But what the impulse represents is say, well, what happens if I tried to take the derivative exactly of that u of t, where it rose infinitesimally fast? How, how, if it rose infinitesimally fast, then the rate of change there should be what? If this guy rises in zero time, how fast did he rise? It, the, 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 the rate there is essentially infinite, right? And so that gives us rise to this thing called the, the impulse function or the Dirac delta function, all right? What it says is it's an idealization. Very hard to have happen, but it's a very useful thing to model real things, okay? Uh, <clears throat> it's basically a function that's really large near t equal to zero, all right? Um, and always has an area of one, all right? That is our definition of this thing. So basically what I'm saying here is this guy has a height Think of it, it doesn't, the shape of it doesn't really particularly matter, right? I usually think of it like this. It has a height of epsilon and it has, uh, a, or sorry, a width of epsilon, okay? And a height here of one over epsilon, okay? If I think of it that way, if I had a box that had, had a, uh, height, a width of epsilon and a height of one over epsilon like that, what would be its area? One, okay? Its area is epsilon times one over epsilon or one, all right? And in the limit, as we let epsilon go to zero, we define for ourselves the Dirac delta function. And the key thing about that Dirac delta is we say, if I take the integral of that thing, from negative infinity to infinity, it's equal to one. And the way we represent the, the Dirac delta is by a little arrow that jumps up like this. All right, at t equal to zero, and I'll call it delta of t. That is our definition of, of that's the way we draw it. Its height is not one, okay? Its height is not one. Its area is one, okay? Its area is one. What's its height? What's its height? If epsilon is really tiny, 
the height of this thing is, it's infinite, right? It's infinite. Now, in problem four, I ask you to, to basically calculate Fourier series coefficients for basically a, a, a periodic set of these impulses, all right? We'll, we'll get to an example problem later on. You will see that when you plot the function, you will get really, really big impulses. You'll get really, really big things when you plot the function. And you'll see that as you plot more and more of the, of the um, harmonics, that they'll get narrower and narrower and narrower and taller and taller and taller. Their area converges to one, all right? But their, but their height is really large. Their width is basically zero, okay? It's something that has an infinite height and zero width. That's an area of one, okay? So this is a purely mathematical thing, but it's really useful to be able to think about things like what I was talking about here, right? Like if I, if I have a real situation where I have the, a function that changes very rapidly, I know that its derivative is really large, but that, that change only happens for a really short time, all right? If I get to the limit where I can really allow things to happen in zero time, then what I call that is the impulse function. All right, so it's a, it's a mathematical description for something that's difficult to have happen, but it, we can get really, really close to it. All right, so <clears throat> if I had something like this, right? So I talked about this function here. This is, this is my f of t. And I wanted to say, well, what is f of t in this case? All right, how would I write that function? Looks like I got a line here, All right? I got a line and I have that impulse. So how should I write that function? How can I, how can I write a, an equation for that function? Piecewise, piece all right? So the first piece, let's say, let's do the equation of the line. What's the equation of the line in, for what I've drawn right there? So I didn't tell you the, I didn't tell you the height here. Let's say the height right here of the function is one. Well, the slope of it is T. T plus one, all right. Now, how do I deal with this uh, impulse here? How do I deal with the impulse? Now I would just say plus delta of T, okay? I could just add it on top of other functions like that, okay? So <clears throat> now that's an unusual function to have in the real world, right? But that's basically what I've drawn. I basically included delta of T, all right? And added it on top of this function. All right, now, what's it useful for? Well, we'll see an example later on, right? But it's tip, first place I can think of it as being useful is modeling something that, that, you know, like a derivative of something that is changing very rapidly. And you, you have that all the time in, in real world problems, like that the case of turning on that voltage. The other example I can think of that happens a lot, all right, is one where I have something like this, let's say, I had some kind of a, an inductive load and I, it was on and then at time t equal to zero, I opened the switch, okay? If you, so where does this happen? So if you, had a, if you had a hair dryer or something like that and you had it plugged into the wall, right? And you pull the plug out, what do you, what do you notice? If I, if I pull, pull a load out of the wall, what do you notice when you do that? You, you get an arcing of some kind, right? Now, why does that happen? Because V equals L di by dt, okay? So what happens if I, at time t equal to zero, I open that switch up? What's the I in the circuit gonna do? Well, I can't, well, it says it could instantaneously change. The theory says that it could. Now, assuming that I can open that switch, I can pull it out of the wall infinitely fast. The theory says that it could. Let's assume that I could do that infinitely fast. What's the voltage gonna look like across that inductor if I do that? It's gonna be infinite, right? Di by dt, and if I looked at what the voltage looked like there, the voltage would be an impulse, negative delta of t. Right? It'd be a huge negative voltage, right? And that puts a huge negative voltage across the switch ultimately and creates that arcing, right? That's, that's essentially what's happening. Now, if I don't, if I, if I just pulled it out of the wall pretty fast, but not infinitely fast, 
it would just be a really big voltage, right? But it would, it, but it wouldn't be quite be an impulse, but it would be a really big voltage. Okay, so it's you can think of this. You even though it's it's an odd thing to think about, all right? It's something that you have some intuitive grasp on, right? But it's it models something that happens infinitesimally fast. Okay, so. Um, so again, the way that I think about this is it, it models physical signals that act over really short time intervals, all right, and whose effect depends on the, on the integral of a signal, okay? So I'm going to give some, some meaning um, to that a little bit, all right? So in this case, you know, I tried to, to represent the way that I would think about that baseball problem that I gave there, right? So I apply a particular force to the ball. So basically what I was trying to say is force equals mass times acceleration, okay? And I said, well, let's, I wanna apply a force that is applied over a really short time period and is really big, okay? So the way, if you rearrange this equation, in this case, it's saying, well, I hit the ball at time t equal to zero, okay? This is what I would get ultimately. This would be the expression for figuring out the, the, the change in velocity. So if you think about what's gonna happen, right? The velocity right before I hit the ball is gonna be negative because the ball is moving towards you. Right after you hit the ball, it's gone through a pretty rapid change all of a sudden, right? Because not only is it not coming towards you, it's going away from you and it's going away from you pretty quickly, right? And so <clears throat> I can use this to model that kind of a situation, all right? now. That's not all that often the way we use it. In fact, we're gonna use it a little bit differently. We're gonna use it a couple of different ways, all right? But the first way we're gonna use it, it's a little bit different, all right? Key thing is what this guy does is he tries to represent essentially something that is happening at one time and one time only, all right? Now, the, the key definition here too is that he has an undefined height, but he has a defined area. All right, he has an undefined height, but a defined area. I say undefined height because we can't say something has an infinite height, right? We can say it's a really big height. We don't know exactly what it is, it's undefined. What I can say is its area is defined to be one, okay? All right, so a um, couple of things about this guy. So some formal mathematical properties that I'll, that I'll put out here, okay? One thing is basically this, if, if I, I want to be, I want to be careful. Um, delta of zero is not a defined value. The area is equal to zero. I can say that delta of T equals zero for T not equal to zero. So in other words, when I drew that function, okay, like this, this is delta of T, all right. I can say that delta of T equals zero for T not equal to zero, but that doesn't mean delta of T or delta of zero is equal to one, right? My, my definition is that it's area is equal to one, okay? Now, <clears throat> there's, some, there's some formal definitions that, this, that, that I include here that I don't wanna spend too much time on other than to say, if I told you, let's say I did the integral of delta t dt from two to three, all right? So here's two, oops, here's two, here's three. What is that integral? Zero, okay? Because there's nothing there. Now, on the other hand, let's say I did it from negative two to two. All right, so or negative negative two to three, all right? What would it be in that case? One. All right, nothing too particularly fancy about that. All right, it's it's actually very integrals, integrals where you have impulse functions in them, you'll love them. All right, because basically they're very simple. I just see where the integral is, and it's an area of one. All right, now one thing I wanted to point out here, because this actually matters for something like what you have in in problem four in the homework is. This guy becomes ambiguous. The integral becomes kind of ambiguous if I say I want to integrate and one of my bounds is zero, okay? So in other words, for what I just drew right here and I said, all right, well, tell me now what the integral is 
from zero to three. All right, why do I say that's ambiguous? Because we don't know which side of zero more or less that we're going from. Yeah, I mean, this whole get this gets into the whole, um, if I started right at zero, well, is that right on the impulse exactly? So sometimes we'll say zero minus, right? For zero minus, then I can say this is one. At, at zero exactly, that's ambiguous and we want to avoid that, all right? We want to avoid that scenario, all right? So, avoid that, all right? I can talk about things like going from, you know, so here, zero plus. Zero plus means where? Where is zero plus? Yeah, right after zero, right on the positive side of zero. So in that case, I'm saying, I'm not including the impulse in my integral, right? I can say I go from zero minus, then I am, all right? So we could talk about that. This matters for us a little bit when I look at a problem like problem four on the homework. Right, we have to figure out, well, how do I set up my integrals, okay? All right, now I wanna talk about two other quick properties of this thing. Like I said, this is, this is not the most exciting thing in the world. I think with what we've said, you probably get most of everything you need to know about the impulse function. All right, a couple of things though, I can scale it and we often see it scaled. All right, so in other words, if I took this guy right here, all right, this function that I've written out here would be I guess we're using f of t here. I'll say this guy is, well, it doesn't want me to delete that. f of t equals two delta t, all right? So I can write this guy, that doesn't mean his height is twice as big, that means what? It's not that his height is twice as big, his area is twice as big, his area is twice as big. All right, and so what I see here is if I evaluate this integral, negative infinity to positive infinity of alpha, some scaling factor, times delta of t dt, what's that gonna be equal to? Alpha, right? Whatever the scaling factor is, that's what it's gonna be equal to. All right, now, I can also talk about shifted impulses, all right? shifted impulses. So let's say I had something like this. Let's say I drew a graph that had an impulse here at one. And as we often write a number next to him implying that's his height, it's his area, okay? You'll see it written that way all the time in textbooks, right? If I had something like that, what is this function here? I'll call this f of t. How would I describe this function f of t? Delta of t minus one, right? If I shift a function to the right, I put a negative number in the shift, right? The way to check that is if I plug in t equal to one here, this guy becomes equal to delta of zero, right? Which is the impulse, okay? All right, now, pretty easy to work with this function. All right, it's really not hard at all to work with this function. All right, <clears throat> one of the things that's really useful about it, and we, we use it to model the sampling process. When I'm sampling a function, all right, we use it as a model, okay? Again, this is a mathematical model. Very, very difficult to ever get this thing in the real world, but it's useful as a model, right? It has this thing called the sifting property, okay? And so what it says is if I multiply a function f of t by an impulse, then what I do is I sift out the value of the function at that time. All right, so if I had in this case, delta of t minus t, this guy here would, if I drew it, right, would look like this, where that's time capital T, right? So if I were to have some function f of t, right? If I multiplied f of t by delta of t minus t, what that's gonna do is it just picks off the value of the function at that point, okay? That's why we sometimes use it to model the process of sampling a signal by an A to D converter, 
all right? Because at regular intervals, I basically pick a, pick a value off of the function. All right, we'll talk about that towards the very end of the semester. All right, so let's, let's use that sifting property here for a second, all right? So what I've done here is I've multiplied f of t by the number two, delta of t plus one, minus three times delta t minus one, and two times delta t plus three, all right? So what I wanna do is I, I'm, I'm saying, I wanna evaluate this integral from negative two to three. All right, so let's, let's real quick, let's just draw what this would look like. All right, so let's, let's draw the thing I'm multiplying by here, right? So I've got the number two, all right? That's a constant value for all t, okay? Now, what about the delta t plus one? Where does that appear? At negative one. Okay. Where does, and I would say this guy has a height of one, not a height, but an area of one, right? I write it next to it. Okay. What about minus three times delta t minus one? Somebody online. somebody other than Philip. Delta T minus one, where would, where does that appear? At what time value? Well, if it's delta T minus one, one, it wouldn't it be? Plus one, uh, plus one, yeah. And, it, and its area is minus three. And then this uh, two delta T plus three, where, where does that appear? Negative three. Negative three. So here's negative two, negative three. And that guy would be? It'd be of a uh, height of two. Height of, area of two. Oh, sorry, area of two. That's okay. a better way of saying it. Yeah. All right. So if that's the case, and I've said, let's evaluate the integral from negative two to three. So because f of t gets multiplied by each of these things, can I write it like this? Negative two to three of two f of t dt, right, plus, what do I, how do I break these up? I can, I can break them up as individual integrals, right? So let me say it's negative two to three delta t plus one times f of t dt, like that, minus three times negative two to three delta t minus one times f of t dt plus two, negative two to three, delta t plus three times f of t dt. Well, yeah, so that, the, you're right. The last term is zero. Why is the last term zero? This guy goes right away. Why? Why does well, that term? Disappear? Because we don't actually have negative three in there. Yeah, because I'm integrating, I'm integrating from negative two right here to three. All right, so I'm only integrating over this range. So this guy's not even in there, right? But he's, he's not defined over that range, okay? Now, <clears throat> the first integral here, I don't know what f of t is. So this guy is basically two times the integral f of t dt. I'd have to figure out what f of t is to, to get that out, right? What about the other two integrals here? What would I say for, so delta t plus one is this guy right here. Minus three times delta t minus one is here, okay? So how do I evaluate those? It's just what? So, so what, so. So here would be, the next one would be one times that of f of t. Not, so not quite, right? The, the whole idea of the sifting property is that it, it, what you're saying is, I, if I take a function and multiply it by the impulse at a certain point, it just pulls off the value of the function at that point. Okay, so what it says is, you, this guy is just simply the value of, f of minus one. 
In other words, the act of multiplying, if you think about what's going to happen, right? I'm taking a function. Here's f of t. I'm multiplying f of t by something that is defined to be zero everywhere except at that one point. And so it's making f of t zero everywhere else. And the area of, of the impulse is one. So it's basically like what I've done is I've, I've multiplied that area by whatever the value of the function is at that point, right? So it's f of minus one. You've zeroed out the rest of the function and just pulled off one value from it, okay? So what would I do for the next one here? What value do I pull out of the function? f of one. So this guy would be minus three times f of one. All right, so there's a minus three. That's what the three multiplier means. All right, so the sifting property becomes really important whenever I'm using this thing. Um, all right, we, talk, we talked about this idea of the, of the derivative, right? I wanna jump ahead to this picture right here, all right? Very similar to what you have in problem four on the homework, okay? So I've got a, what I call a train of impulses, right? So it's basically just a bunch of impulses that are repeating. Now, first of all, if I look at this, is this a periodic wave? Looks periodic, right? It's repeating. Um, and it's, it's repeating with what period here? It's a period of two, if I'm not mistaken. Period of two, T equals two, okay? So if you look back to my very first slide today, I said, well, all right, um, I got four steps. I figured out the period. Now I gotta figure out what the function is over that period, okay? This one's a little bit more complicated because I, I got to do the, the Fourier series integral, right? I want to figure out the Fourier series coefficients for this guy. So that means I got to do, so this was step one. Now step three is going to be to figure out for myself alpha n equals one over t integral zero to t x of t e to the negative j n omega naught t dt, like that. All right. Um, the, quest the question here basically is, what's the function? Would it be like one to the nth power or something like that? Not quite. Because I'm looking at this in every, or is it negative one to the something power. Well, even before I even before I do this, right? These are all impulses. So first of all, this number is not a height, right? What is it? It's just the um, area. The area there. Okay. And and the the guys at the bottom, th these are negative twos, right? All right, just to be clear. Now, the question I said is, first of all, just think about this integral for a second. 0 to t. So that would be 0 to 2, right? Doesn't that kind of cause problems? Isn't that ambiguous? I could do zero minus to two minus. All right, I, which which will work. I, in my mind, I'll say, well, why don't I go from if I drew if I went backwards a little bit, right? I would see this guy, and I would see this guy. I got to always integrate over a period. And I said this before, I can over integrate over any period I want. So why not go from here to here? That's a period, right? In other words, what I'm saying is I'm going to integrate from negative t over four, one fourth of a period before. If I started at negative t over four, where would I end? What would be the end of a period? Uh, t of three fourths. Yeah, three fourths t. All right, I chose that. I, I could do zero, zero minus to two minus. That would work as well, right? Um, but I prefer to avoid the zero minus and, and all that kind of stuff. So, t, so minus t over four to, to three fourths t. Okay. So in that in in that interval, there. What would the function be? What is my x of t over that window? So in other words, between negative t over four to three t over four, what's that function gonna be? How would I write that guy? X of t equals what? Two times negative, I wanna say negative one to the 
No, so two, two times oh. I got to write it in terms of those impulses, right? So if I have an impulse centered at T equal to zero, what did we call that? Delta T, right? I have two times Delta T, okay? What do I do with this impulse here? I have one other impulse in that period, right? That impulse at T equals one and he goes down negative two. So how would I define that? Minus two delta T plus one. T minus one. Sorry. Right. Or if I shift forward in time, that's a negative in, inside the, the, the time. Okay. So two times delta of T minus two times delta T minus one. That's all I have to do. That's defining the function over a period, right? Now I have to evaluate that integral right there. All right, well, how would I do that? Well, alpha N is one over T. So we said T was two, so one half times the integral of negative T over four. So that's negative one half, all right? To three over four times two Right, so that would be what, uh, three halves? All right, and then I plug in X of T. So I plug in two Delta of T minus two Delta of T minus one times E to the negative J and Omega naught T DT, okay? To solve that, I can use that sifting property, can I? What do the sifting properties say? Right, and what, what's my F of T in this case? It's this guy, right? That's my F of T. So those impulses are picking values off of that F of T. And that F of T in this case is that E to the negative J and omega naught T. All right, so. We've got a one half in front. This is a super easy integral to do. Do I have to do any integration here? No, no integration needed because it's just picking off the value of f of t at those points. All right, so what two points do I have to pick, pick off of? Zero and one, right? So it's one half times two times what? How about e to the negative j n omega naught times zero, right? And then the next one is minus two times what? j n omega naught times one, like that, all right? And as I heard Philip say there, that first term becomes what? e to the I don't know what J is. Well, I know what J is. I know what, I don't know what N is. Omega naught we could calculate, but I don't really care what any of it is because it's all multiplied by what? Zero. So what's E to the zero? E to the zero is one. So that means I got two, two times one, right? Minus two times, and I could do all kinds of fun stuff uh, to manipulate this guy. Right, e to the negative j and omega naught. I could plug in Euler's identity, which is to say, you know, e to the j theta equals cosine theta plus. J. I could simplify that down, and if I did that, I, I probably would find all kinds of things like, well, this thing could get simplified and, and become sines and cosines and all sorts of stuff like that. I don't want to do that. All right, what I what have I determined here? So let's back up for a second. I just figured out. Remember, I said this guy is going to be a function of n. It is right? I know everything else is just a number here, right? Omega naught is a number. I haven't written in what the number is, but what would omega naught be in this case? Omega naught would be two pi over two or pi, right? It's a number, okay? N is the function, right? So, Backing up for a second, we did calculus. We did funny calculus with funny things, all kinds of crazy functions. The hell is this thing at the end of the day? What have I just determined? See if you guys actually know that. 
What is alpha of n? What does it tell me? Coefficients of the Fourier series that produce this thing. So going back all the way to the very beginning, we can get so lost in the math sometimes, right? So basically it says that it's the Fourier series coefficients. It tells me for each harmonic number, right? What's the amplitude of the sine wave or the cosine wave that I need to add in to get to creating this function, okay? So in other words, if, if you go in and you write as, as you will do in, in the code, right? And we talked about how to do this last time. If I write a for loop that executes this thing, what am I, do, what am I doing, right? If I, if I go from negative infinity to positive infinity, what am I doing there, right? Why, do, why does this go from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? What, is, what does it mean to include the negatives here and the positives? What does this effectively become? Well, it becomes sines and cosines, right? Sines and cosines. Average. Well, to, to go from, from n equal negative infinity to positive infinity means that I, I'm going to end up with, you know, sines and cosines when I combine these things, right? If I think about just having alpha minus 1 e to the negative j omega naught t plus alpha 1 e to the j omega naught t, somehow that guy equals c of 1 cosine omega naught t plus some angle right? Somehow that guy is a cosine. So in other words, what this says is I can take a bunch of cosines and add them up and eventually they're going to look like that. All right. Is what it says. That's what you're going to do in the code. And what you're going to, what you're going to see when you plot this is you're going to see something really big and it's going to probably look like this. like that. So it's, so they're going to be getting narrower and they're going to be getting really big because that's what they're supposed to do, right? They're supposed to get narrow and big as an area of one has a height that's undefined. Okay. That's, that's what you should see. Basically what this is saying is that the cosines that go into this guy have a particular shape such that they'll become that function when they're all added together. That's the whole idea of the Fourier series, right? Now, <clears throat> again, um, it's, it's a useful concept in and of itself. The math's not particularly interesting or exciting or any of that kind of stuff, right? It's just calculus to get to this point, All right? The key takeaway for you guys in, in these problems that you've got is basically right now, you're gonna, you're gonna do the calculus and you're gonna evaluate it to see that it actually looks like the function it's supposed to look like. If when you use those Fourier series coefficients in this equation, if it doesn't look like the function it's supposed to look like, you did something wrong in your calculus. All right. And I say in your calculus, because if you look at the stuff from last week, I more or less gave you the code that'll work. All right. So the only thing you can really get wrong is the calculus. All right. The impulse is an important idea. I'm not going to say a whole lot much more about it right now. All right. Other than to say, you know, the sifting property becomes the really useful thing. And integrals that apply the sifting property become really simple because I don't have to do any integration. All right, I'm just picking values off of a function, okay? All right, now, one place we can use this, um, there's lots of places where you can use the, the idea of an impulse, but I wanted to use it because one place it applies is in this idea of what, I've, what, what I call the Fourier transform. Now, I think in, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but you guys should have seen in differential equations, something called a Laplace transform. Yep. Yep. Okay. Somebody said yes. That means it, it happened. No, we've, um, we've, we've covered it. Okay. So there's, there's a whole series of transforms that exist in the world. Um, the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform are very closely related to each other. The Fourier transform is what we use typically to deal with something called aperiodic signals. So what's an aperiodic signal, do you think? It's not period. It's not periodic. Yeah. It doesn't repeat at any regular interval. Like e to the e to the negative t. Right? That's not periodic. E to the negative t would look like this. Right? That's not periodic. It's never going to repeat itself. Okay. 
Now, <clears throat> we're not going to use it for aperiodic signals. It exists for all signals, whether they're periodic or aperiodic. It's the generalization of a Fourier series. And it's really useful. And we've looked at it before. Okay. When I showed you at the very beginning, when I showed you my voice basically being analyzed by my phone. All right. That's essentially what I'm looking at here. All right. So what I've drawn here is this is a voice signal that I got from some little crappy oscilloscope app on, that I put on my phone. All right. So this is X of T. This is me yelling at my phone. All right. Now, if I look at that, that's me yelling at my phone. And, and what does that look like? That's a voltage. So what happens is my phone has a, has a microphone. And the microphone basically converts the sound waves into a voltage that should have the same frequencies as what I'm speaking. Okay. So I get this voltage. I'm going to call it X of T. If I gave you that and said, make meaning of that, you wouldn't be able to probably. Right. Think about for a second. Um, nowadays, voice recognition is a big thing, right? Alexa is there and it, and it recognizes your voice. I could potentially get things that will recognize your voice and not just anybody's voice, right? But for Alexa to be able to do that, to have that kind of a voice recognition capability, it's basically getting a voltage inside of Alexa. There is a voltage that looks like this guy, X of T, all right? But for it to be able to say, well, you just told me to, you know, check the weather, right? For it to know that you did that, it's got to do some analysis on this thing. So that analysis it's going to do a typical, we say I've got a spectrum analyzer. So this will be done in code, right? So really what, what you would have, I'm just going a step beyond what I need to talk about here, but I would have some sort of a microcontroller that would be doing some of that work here to figure out what do you think? What do you think I want to figure out about this? I want to figure out what frequencies are in there. What frequencies are in there and how big are they? So it's essentially the Fourier coefficients. I want to figure those out. And I need to go beyond that. I need to not just figure out what they are, but I need to figure out how they kind of, how those frequencies kind of come together in time. Because those frequencies, me saying a certain set of frequencies in a certain way represents a word. All right, this gets way beyond anything we're doing here. There's a whole theory about how voices um, come together and things called phonemes and all sorts of crazy stuff. And I'm not going to talk about here. Essentially, some of this stuff would be done in a microcontroller where it does some basic analysis and then it's going to send that information up to the cloud where Amazon and is going to think hard about this to say, well, what you really said was this. All right, but the first step is that I have to take this X of T and I got to deconstruct it. I got to extract and do some analysis to extract some meaning out of that thing. And the way to do that is to say, well, I don't know what, fr what frequencies are in there and, and, and for how long. And probably watch how, that, how those frequencies change over time. So we talked about a way to do that. And that's basically the Fourier series, right? I could essentially look at that waveform. And I showed a way that you could do this, right? Which is to say I could do a multiplication and then I could do an integral and then I could multiply by two. All right. And that is the classic definition of it for a continuous function. I can turn all of that into a digital thing. All right. And I can turn that into something I call a fast Fourier transform, FFT. You may have heard the term FFT before. People have heard FFT. FFT is actually just an algorithm that implements the Fourier transform. All right. Although people use that term all the time. It's, I can turn this into basically an algorithm that does all of the analysis that is essentially this. All right? It does that analysis for me, computes that integral for me. All right. <clears throat> so in this case, what would come out is something that looks like this. So I took that signal there and I ran it through essentially what is I, what I call a Fourier transform. Okay. Now I wanted to look at this slowly and carefully. So my, my X axis here is F, frequency in Hertz, right? Not frequency in radians per second. Cause the way I said, nobody thinks in radians per second. All right, everybody thinks in terms of Hertz. All right, so what do you think the, what, what, what is this then? What is this telling me when I look at this graph? 
what the amplitudes are at different frequencies. So this, this tells me, now it's not telling me the exact value of the amplitude. This would be useful from a relative perspective, right? I can see that the highest guy is right here. The second highest is, is right here at about 412 Hertz, all right? Um, now why it shows 412 to 824, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but you're gonna see most of your voice stuff is, is typically here. All right, this is my voice. If you looked at, at, it, at a male voice versus a female voice, what would be different between a male voice and a female voice? What's that? Yeah, so where, where, would, the, where, would, these, where would the spikes be if it was a woman? So it, it would be, it'd be, it'd be a higher voice, higher frequencies would appear, all right? And that's how they, they use this information to be able to say, well, if I see these spikes in this order over a certain time period, you were saying this word. Okay, that's, that's the way, you know, one way in which you could use that. And I'm, I'm highly simplifying that the way that algorithm would work, right? But this would be the first step in the process is I would have to extract this information. So <clears throat> I wanna think about how this Fourier transform, cause it's, it's a little bit different than the series, right? The series, we didn't sketch anything as a function of frequency, right? What you did was you calculated alpha n values. You calculated the coefficient at the nth harmonic. And now what this guy is doing is it's plotting those coefficients versus frequency, okay? So there's a little bit of a difference there. So let's say I had this guy here, x of t equals three cosine two pi t minus 30. So I expanded this into the complex form of the Fourier series. All right, just to be clear, I used Euler's identity to get from here to here, right? This was Euler. And effectively, I have said that this is equal to like that, okay? That is the complex form of the Fourier series for that particular function, all right? So in this case, what, what, value, what harmonics do I have here? Should only have one harmonic, right? What is it? The first one, right? If I only have one signal, I have one harmonic. N equals one. And I have alpha one and alpha minus one. What are alpha one and alpha minus one? Not just three halves. This is the negative J30, right? At omega equal to two pi. So at, at this, this is the frequency here for n equal to one. And this is the frequency here for n equal to minus one. Okay, so this guy would be three halves e to the j30. Okay, so if I were to graph that in terms of this idea of the Fourier transform, I can graph it either versus F or versus omega, whatever I want, okay? How would I draw that? What do you think? First of all, what frequencies, the way I think about this is at what frequencies is there energy in that signal, right? At what frequencies do I have energy in that signal? So what, in other words, at what frequencies do I have terms? Two, well, two pi and at what other frequency? Negative two pi. In the complex form of it, I have it at two pi and negative two pi. The Fourier transform is defined in terms of the negative and positive frequencies. So what I would say is right here at two pi and at negative two pi, all right, so at one hertz and negative one hertz, if I want to think of it that way, I have some signal, all right? And in particular, what do I have? Well, I would have, at this point, I'm going to say I have three halves e to the minus j 30 degrees. And over here, I have three halves e to the j 30 degrees, like that, okay? Now, I got to be a little bit careful about this because e to the j 30 is a is a complex thing right so instead if 
I looked at that plot, in this case, e to the three halves e to the j 30 and three halves e to the minus j 30 is a complex number, right? I can't plot a complex number, can I? I could plot its magnitude, couldn't I? Right? So if I plotted its magnitude, what happens to the e to the e to the minus j 30? Just goes away. What I could also do is I could say, well, I want to plot the angle there as well. How would I do that? Yeah, right here, this would be negative 30. And this guy would be, or wait. Yeah. This guy is 30 degrees. And this guy is negative 30 degrees, like that. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll do more of this on, on Thursday, but basically what I have is the Fourier transform tells me the frequencies at which our signal has energy. And by definition, it is this guy. We write it as big, so if I had the signal X of T, all right, if it's periodic, then X of T has a Fourier transform that is written like this. Now, what have I used here? I've used the impulse, right? Why did I use the impulse here? Why did I use the impulse? Because I'm saying here that this guy is simply has energy at that one spot, just there, only there. So I wrote this basically as the, the transform. I said this guy has three halves e to the negative j 30 at the frequency minus at the frequency two pi and at the frequency minus two pi. All right, so it gets written like that. I write it in terms of the impulses, All right? It's, it's, it's a way of expressing that I have, I have energy at just one single point. Only at that point, that's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so what I, what I see here is essentially in my voice, right? <clears throat> this, this guy here is, I don't know, we'll call this alpha one, at least the magnitude of it. This is the magnitude of alpha two. This is the magnitude of alpha three, magnitude of alpha four. Now, eventually, if I look at this hard enough, you'll, you'll actually see that, well, it looks like I have some stuff that doesn't look like it's integer multiples. And that's because in general, it's probably picking up something that's not fully periodic. Now, the Fourier transform can be, can be applied to any signal whatsoever, right? Even one that's not periodic. If I have a periodic signal, this is the Fourier transform of a periodic signal. Where there is a way to calculate a Fourier transform straight away from a signal. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at signals and we're gonna as assemble their Fourier transform from what they are. Right, so we're not, we're not gonna, in signals and systems, you'll deal a lot more with the Fourier transform and the theory behind it, right? In this case, I wanna motivate the idea of it, all right? And then we'll, we'll actually, we'll apply it um, in the last part of the, of the class. Um, yeah, so so stuff stuff down here, you know, like this is probably some noise. All right, the fact that this drops off so much um, down to zero like that probably tells me something we'll talk about a little bit later, which probably tells me that there's a, a limit to the frequencies that my phone can pick up. And it probably has a limit somewhere around 1500 Hertz. And the reason it does is because most people don't have much signal there's not much in your voice outside of 1500, all right, or so. Okay. All right. That's it. Um, any questions you guys have online?